It is not often that we have a retired Major General come to speak to us on campus. It's a fairly unique opportunity we have, and we're just delighted to have Dr. Lovekey with us today. Uh, Dr. Lovekey has a distinguished career both in the military and a diplomatic career. He also is Dr. Lovekey because uh, he did PhD work on Soviet studies at the University of Miami, had a master's at Middleborough College, and then he got his BA, BA? guess, in civil engineering from West Point. We're just delighted to have him here today. Um, among other things he'll be talking to us about um, is his new book that's just been published in English, China, Our Enemy, A General Story. And uh, let me just read this, this short blurb that was written in the introduction of this, of this book um, by the Chinese publisher. It said, this is a story of a man who creates friendships between soldiers, students, and leaders. He has been called many things, warrior, diplomat, athlete, teacher, and healer. He was first called the Peace General by a reporter in Latin America. In Africa, he was called the American Healer. In China, he is simply the General, our friend. Please join with me in welcoming General Lovekey. I wonder if you would do me a favor. This is what we did in the Army after we ran five miles every day. We would stand up and hold hands. I don't want you to kiss yourselves. Just hold hands. Stand up and hold hands. And make it a circle. Make it a circle. No kissing. Just hold hands. No hugging. Repeat after me, please. Come on over in the front here and hold my hand. We'll let you in. Uh, that's great. Here we go. Just repeat after me, please. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to be an American. For at least I know I'm free. For at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men and women. I won't forget the men and women. Who gave that right to me. Who gave that right to me? And I'll gladly stand up. And I'll gladly stand up next to you. Next, next to you. And defender still today. And defender still today. Because there is no doubt. Because there is no doubt. I love this land. I love this land. God bless the USA. God bless the USA. Give a hand. You did that well. Tell you what I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to tell you what I told you. What I'm going to tell you is very easy, and I've got the Colonel back there who's going to raise his hand if you he can't hear me. What I'm going to tell you is the following. And I want you to write it down, please. V I P. Vip. That's my vision. I guess I'm being told to go to the mic because they're taping this. As a good soldier, I obey. I want you to remember VIP. VIP stands for vision, the instrument, and the plan. These are the three items that I'm making my next four or five years really represent my life and that of my son and my daughter. My son graduates in about three weeks from Duke University. He's been with me all over the world as my medic. He started when he was 16. And this book is in his honor of graduation. This was just finished about four weeks ago. So he hadn't seen it. I'm giving it to him tomorrow when we're going to go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina and talk to all the medical officers in the US Army. But what I wanted to talk to you today is China, the relationships. And we've had relationships with China since 1972. But for 18 years, for 18 years, 18 years, we were not allowed to shake hands with Chinese. It was a policy by Foster Dollars. He did not allow 
U.S. diplomats to shake hands with Chinese diplomats. Sir, would you come up, please? Sir, would you come up, please? Shake my hand. How are you? Good, good to see you. I was not allowed to shake his hand. This went on, thank you very much. This went on for 18 years. During those 18 years, we fought each other twice. We fought the Chinese in Korea, and we fought the Chinese in Vietnam. Many of you may not know, we did have a lot of our pilots being shot over Hanoi and other cities being shot by Chinese anti-aircraft artillery. My roommate at West Point was killed by a Chinese mine. The man who influenced me most in my life, Sergeant Larry Morford, a Mormon, died 15 days before coming home. He was killed by a Chinese bullet. I've been wounded by a Chinese mortar. So I've had a long history of Chinese relationships. When I was assigned as the first general officer into China, I was given one mission and one mission only from my chief of staff of the Army. Go to China and make sure we don't fight Chinese ever again. That was my mission. So I took it at heart and I decided that if I leave the Army in one piece after four years in combat, I would devote my life into making sure that the United States and China never face each other as enemies again. And during that time, I would promote the memory of Larry Morford, Sergeant Larry Morford, one of the soldiers in my battalion. The things that I wanted to tell you is that Larry Morford was a peacemaker. He was a peacemaker because he volunteered for every hard duty. This is a horse that I have in my home in Florida. It's about this size. I saw it in Shanghai. Two years later, I came back. It was still there, and I bought it. A talented artist made a painting out of that. That horse has a, a sword on his right hand and has a, a spear on the left hand. I took the sword out of the right hand and put banners in there, the qualities of a good leader, of a good person. Then I took the spear out of it and put our family shield, which is a heart and a key. I've been going to China since 1973, and I go every two years as a minimum. And the Chinese have a hard time pronouncing my name. My name is Lefke, but it's a difficult name. It's difficult to spell it. So the Chinese says, Lefke, Lefke, how, how do you want to say? Just say love and key. I'll accept that. Just think of love and key. So they called me Lefke, and one of my students at a university that I gave in China wrote a little heart and wrote a key. General, you're our love key. So I took that as our family tree and our children love it. So from this day on, I became love key family. And the heart is not so much as love, but service to others. And I think the ROTC here has a cap that they just gave me, and in it has service to others. And what I wanted to do is show you the man who changed my life. He's on your left. His name is Sergeant Larry Morford, a very devout Mormon who didn't believe in the war, yet, as all Mormons are, very patriotic, volunteered for the Army, volunteered for the infantry, and when I was the battalion commander, he volunteered for every dangerous mission. And I had a program which I called it the Foxhole Exchange Program, where I exchanged places with a soldier every other night. And he usually won that award for being the most outstanding soldier. And one of the requirements that he had to do, whoever won that award, is that he had to write me a letter saying what we're doing well and what we're doing badly. After he won that award five times, I got close to him by saying, Morford, why are you in the Army since you're such a devout Christian, since you're a devout Mormon? And his answer was, sir, the job you and I are doing out here is the job of a beast. We're out here killing each other. And the least beastly of us should be doing this. The least beastly of us should be doing it. So he volunteered for the Army. And he said, I couldn't stay home 
when my fellow citizens were fighting in Vietnam. He was probably one of 3% in my battalion who were volunteers. All the others were draftees. They were there because they were drafted. They were there and didn't want to be there. He was a volunteer. And he says, sir, why do we have patrols that kill and ambush? Why don't we have patrols that make the enemy surrender? So that's how he was killed. He was killed trying to get a patrol to surrender. He died 15 days before coming home. That's Sergeant Larry Morford. Every day I begin the day saying, thank you, Larry, because he, in a way, saved my life. And the reason that I'm here at Brigham Young is that we're establishing an award, an annual award, that will be given to a student at Brigham Young who does the best essay making sure that we never go to war with China again. Whoever writes the best poem, whoever writes the best song, whoever writes the best essay on how to promote peace with China will win this award. It will be a plaque at West Point. It will be a plaque. It's not too much money. It's $400, and a cadet will never get it because that money is going for food for the poor to do some project in Central America where there is a water pump, but what that cadet will have is a plaque in that village donated by the cadet. It will be in his name. On top of that, there'll be a certificate with two general officers commemorating his award. So that's why I'm here today, is to establish that award so that beginning next year, every year, there will be a Larry Morford award to make his memory live. I could, I only have one other place, that's West Point, where we honor him every year. We have the Morford Award at West Point, and it'll be here, because Larry was a Mormon. So we want to do it here, and I want to do it fast enough because his father did the first award at West Point, and he died two months later. He was very sick when he went, but he got to see his son being remem remembered. His mother is getting on in age, and I want her to be the person that awards the first award next year, Mrs. Morford. So let me go to the, your right. And your right is the Chinese hero, a Chinese hero by the name of Lei Feng. In China, Lei Feng was the motivator to getting people to do things for other people. He was the engine. And the reason that he became the hero is because in the middle of the winter, when it's freezing, minus 40 or minus 30, he would get up and stoke up the little stoves of widows in the middle of the winter with coal. Wherever you needed anything done, you would get Lei Feng to do it. So the Chinese think Lei Feng is the biggest motivator. I just came back from China five days ago, and I was at the Lei Feng Museum in Hangzhou, one of the cities, and I told him, I'm just writing a book, and I'm putting Lei Feng on a cover to show you how much I really respect the kind of community service that Corporal Lei Feng did. And the book compares Lei Feng to Morford. So these two died defending their country at the same age. They were both 22 years old. I told you to remember three things. VIP, the vision, the instrument, and the plan. What's the vision? The vision is simply to be teaching children to teach others preventive medicine. Again, the vision is to teach children to teach others preventive medicine. That is, I want that child to be able to go home and teach his parents preventive medicine. We've been doing this for four years now in China. And what we're going to do is, in conjunction with Brigham Young, those people that want to join the West Point cadets into northern China, they will be teaching in elementary schools children preventive medicine. And we give them a manual to go by. And the vision is that through this element of, well, let me digress here. How many of you like square dancing? Raise your hand. Square dancing. 
two, three. How many of you like to sing? Oh, quite a few, good. How many of you uh, like marathons? How many of you like to tinker with cars? How many of you like to be healthier? Everybody. Everybody. So what we do is we have medicine opens doors, and we teach our West Point cadets to go to school and teach wellness because everybody wants to be healthier. So, and the Chinese uh, government officials love West Point cadets going there to do that in the schools. So that's the vision, is to teach children to teach others wellness lessons. And what's the instrument? Well, we got a book that we give the cadets. It's in Chinese, but we're gonna make it better. Bring them young, I spent just two hours with your Chinese department and by the way, I congratulate you. I also heard the Chinese classes, and they were outstanding. I was very impressed with what I heard. And Brigham Young, of course, the U.S. Army relies on you all for linguists. So Brigham Young is very dear to our heart. But the instrument is the book that we have that shows the 10 wellness lessons. And I've left it here for, uh, for your language department to make it better. But we also do in conjunction this magic book. And this is a magic book that I had great difficulties in getting it done. For three years I tried to get this magic book done in the United States and I couldn't do it. It was too hard, too labor intensive. So I went to my Chinese friend and I said, I want to produce this. He says, show me what you got. And I had a prototype, but it, it wasn't functioning well. He says, okay, just tell me a little bit more detail. Within 24 hours, within 24 hours, he retooled his factory to produce 1,000 of these magic books. And this is what we do. The cadets teach children through the magic book how to teach preventive medicine. Yeah, I need to go back to the, to the podium. Yeah, you're done. Okay, you're all right. I've got a mobile mic. Yeah, you hold it. For you. you hold it for me. I'll go back. I'll go back as a good soldier. I just need to show them this. This is the magic book. So we teach them the wellness lessons, and we tell them, "You want to be a good soldier? I want you to join this peacemaker army. You will not have it to shoot bullets. You will not have to carry weapons. Your weapon is to be able to teach preventive medicine to others. So this is the soldier." that we want you to become. We want you to become a wellness soldier. And we want you to be able to teach 10 wellness lessons. Let me have some colors. Throw me colors. Blue. Blue. Throw me more. Red. Okay, red. How about something else? Red. All right, just by you telling me this thing changed to colors. Did you see that? It changed to colors. It was black and white before. Each one of these pages is a wellness lesson. So you got the attention of the kids. The kids automatically, how'd you do that? How'd, well, you learn the lesson, we'll teach you, and you can have the book. And then we say, at the end of the day, after you've taught these to your parents, and they practice what you've taught, they will be free of disease. Okay, it didn't work well. Take a deep breath, everybody. Breathe it out. Not well enough. Breathe in again. Breathe it out. See, you blew it out. The thing disappeared. And so what we say is when you teach that wellness lesson well, this disease will disappear. Thank you, Colonel. You do that well. <laughs> so that's the instrument. And the plan is very simple. We want young people to go around China teaching wellness lessons with the manual and a magic book. I need a million dollars because I want a hundred people going every year. So that's what I'm going all over the place is to raise one million dollars to send 100 young people because it cost me thirteen hundred dollars. I already gave a hundred thousand of my own. It cost me thirteen hundred dollars to send one person. Once they're in China, the Chinese pick it up, but the airfare is so expensive. So the plan is to go with a hundred people 
and I want you to join the Army now. I don't want a million dollars from you, but if you can afford 25 bucks, you will be a soldier in a peacemaker army. You will get a certificate from West Point with two generals with your name on it saying, what is your name, sir? Uh, Brian Priest. Re Priest. Brian Priest, soldier in the Peacemaker Army, a certificate from the United States Military Academy, and two generals signing it so that you can put it on your wall and say, I'm helping the plan to populate China with people from Brigham Young and West Point teaching preventive medicine. Go ahead. China, that's the topic, so let me cover it real quickly. China has 14 neighbors, as you can see there. It's a big country, and it has more neighbors than anybody that I know. There might be one more, but I don't know which one it is. But it's got 14 neighbors. It fought three wars with three of those neighbors. And now they've got conflicts, not with the physical land neighbors, but you've got conflicts with Japan, you've got conflicts with uh, Philippines. And the wars that they have fought is against Russia over a Damansky Island, which is a new Surrey River. In international relations, those of you that are taking it, when there is a river between two countries, that's the border. And the border is in the middle of the river. Well, it happens that Missouri has a lot of islands, and there are islands that are right in the middle. So the Chinese and Russians have fought each other in one of those islands called Damansky Island. They fought with Vietnam. You know, people think of Vietnam, that's uh, something that the United States fought. Well, we fought in Vietnam for about 13 years. We lost about 40,000 killed. When I left Vietnam and we, the U.S. Army left Vietnam and the military left Vietnam, within three years later, the Chinese invaded Vietnam, and they suffered 45, no, I'm sorry, that's what we suffered. They suffered 25,000 dead in three weeks fighting the Vietnamese. They suffered in three weeks half the number of dead that we had 12 years fighting them. So these are communists fighting each other. So don't be afraid when somebody says communist. I'm not afraid of communism. I lived in Russia for four years in the height of the Cold War. Communism doesn't work. Let them have communism. China sooner or later will find out that it is much better to go another route. I don't see China as communist. I don't. They're more capitalistic than a lot of us are here. So they're a socialist state, but I think that will go. So here it is, China and the 14 borders. In contrast, you have the United States with only two land borders. We have Canada and we have Mexico. They both are friendly and weak states compared to the United States. And then we have to the east, we have Atlantic fish, and to the west, we have Pacific fish. So we have the best of all worlds. We don't need to worry. Yeah, we got drug trafficking. Yeah, our, our borders are porous, but not to the intensity that other nations have. I put in there the world, and I split it. You got the western hemisphere on the left, and you got the rest of the world, which is a crazy place. Just take Africa, 1,500 different languages. You, Brigham Young, that loves Africa with all these languages. I only saw about 10 languages that you teach from Africa. They have over 1,500. It's a basket case, that area of the world. However, the Western Hemisphere is cleaner. We have Spanish, we have Portuguese, we have French, we have English. We have Haitian with Creole, Guarani, but those are not um, uh, very major languages. So we have Spanish, Portuguese, French, and English. It's doable, and it's Romance languages. You know one, the other one is easy. But the Western Hemisphere is also a pretty peaceful area. It's an area where we can do things together to really promote peace. And that's what I want to do with Latin America and China. I want to cooperate with China in bringing preventive medicine to the elementary schools. In Chinese, the ideogram for friendship in olden times were two hands, all the way to the left, moving together. Because friends have a common purpose. They go together. Over time, that ideogram evolved to the ideogram to the right, 
where you have two hands clasped together. Coming over, I'm going to use you again. Coming over. I've been wounded on the right hand, so it's not very good. You hold my hand. Try to tear us apart. Try to tear us apart. Go as hard as you can. Go harder. <laughs> tear us apart. Go harder. <laughs> you can't do it. You got it. And this is what friendship is that you're binding. Thank you, gentlemen. Would you give him a hand? That's what friendship is, that you bind together so hard that no external force can rip us apart. That's what friendship is, that we have common things. That's why we're going in one direction. And the direction that I want us to go is preventive medicine in the Western Hemisphere. I support Children Incorporated, which has 64 feeding centers all over Latin America. I give my treasure to that. I send West Point cadets, if you want to be fed through the line, go get your food through the line. But at the end of the line, we're going to teach you preventive medicine. So if you want to eat, you're going to have to learn this preventive medicine. Then we want you to teach it to your parents. So that's 18 years without a handshake with the Chinese. Now the handshake that I want to do with Chinese is serving in Latin America. How many have you seen, seen this? I know you've got a couple of psychology majors. How many have you has seen this? One, two, three. OK, let me ask you a question. How many of you see a rabbit? How many of you see a duck? How many see both? How many see none? Usually, uh, this is an outstanding exercise because even though it's well known in psychological books, not many people really know the effects. The duck is on your left side. There's the bill of the duck. The rabbit is up on top. There's the mouth of the rabbit. And what the two bill of the duck is for the rabbit, it's the ears. So you got a rabbit and a duck. And once psychology tells you, once you see one, you have trouble seeing the other. Yeah, all of you now know there's a duck and a rabbit, but you can't see both at the same time. It says, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see it. I, I see it. No, you can't. The mind instantaneously can only see one, maybe a fraction of a second, but you can only take one at a time. And what I'm trying to say is that if you have a perception that somebody is evil, if somebody is bad, they won't see the good part of you. And that's called scotoma. It's a Greek word for blindness. If you have a scotoma that this person is bad, you won't see the good things of this person. You'll only see the things that reinforce the bad part. And the amazing part on psychology, and people disagree the exact percentage, but it's over 90%. I've seen it often say 97%. We are 97% or around that area, emotional. We're not rational. We're emotional, number one, and 3% rational. If you want to get to somebody to accept what you want to say or do, you've got to resolve the emotional issue first. If they're in anger, forget it. I'm a mediator. I volunteer to go through mediation course took three weeks, then a month with preceptors, and I mediate for free for the poor in Florida who can't afford a mediator and they have a problem with the landlord. So I go and do that once a month just to keep my mediation skills. If you haven't been a mediator, I propose that you go and get a mediation certificate. It's not that hard to get. It's not that difficult, and it will make you a better person. So. 97% emotional, 3% rational. And what makes us emotional is when people don't agree with us. And when people don't agree with us, there's certain factors involved. Maybe they haven't heard us well enough, or maybe we haven't heard them well enough, or maybe we don't understand them. What we got up here is John Glenn. He was the first American to circle the Earth on his rocket. It was kind of interesting as he circled the rocket, the Earth with his rocket. He looked and he had lots of cards. You got, uh, you got a card there? Or? Carbon index card. 
he had lots of cards with him. And each one of these cards had a language. In case that capsule fell in any one of these countries that he was orbiting, he could take out this capsule and say, I'm an American. I've been flying in space. Please take me to the American ambassador in any one of these languages. And what he saw, that in most languages, the words stranger and enemy were the same. In most primitive languages, the word stranger and enemy are the same. I had a conversation with my son. I spent four years in combat in Vietnam. And when he got to be seven, he said, Dad, you fought a long time. Did you hate the enemy? And then this is a five-year-old. Puts you in a question. He said, son. To tell you the truth, I didn't even know my enemy. I just knew that he, that uh, person who was a Viet Cong was trying to kill me and kill the troops that I had. But did you hate him? Did you know him? Did you love him? What, what? Son, let me put it this way. My policy now is to make sure that we never have strangers anywhere in the world because strangers are easy to hate. Strangers are logical enemies. So, son, you've got, you love our shield, love key. Our family is key. We're using medicine as the key, service to other, to make sure we change strangers to friends so they don't become enemies. Go ahead, flip it over, keep going. This is America. The Chinese gave us the most beautiful they have 40,000 ideograms in their language. They gave us the most beautiful ideogram to signify America. America in Chinese is Mei, Mei, which means beautiful, Mei. There are really 200 Mei's that you say Mei in Chinese. If you say Mei, 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 there are different Mei's. But there's only one Mei with that ideogram. And the ideogram usually is a sheep you can see the horns, that's it, and that's beautiful. And then the second ideogram, you got the sheep ideogram there to your left, and I put plus the second ideogram, which is a man. This is a man. That's a man. With both his hands stretched out. And in Chinese, that's the ideogram for da, for big. So sheep and big translated into May, which is beautiful. And I loved, wherever I went to China, I said, I want to thank you. You got 40,000 ideograms. You gave us the best ideogram in your whole language, in your whole dictionary. We're May. Because when I went to China, they would say, you're a beautiful person. I said, I'm a beautiful person? It says, yeah, you're from America, the beautiful country. So you're a beautiful country person. So even while they were fighting us in Korea, they had to call us beautiful. Next. Keep going. I'm running out of time, and I want question times. This, I just want you to remember it. Write it down. Uh, how many of you are psychology majors? OK, you got two, three, three of them. Write this down, but it's important for all of you. Because this is the secret to success between a man and a woman, between a man and a man, between a woman and a woman, between a company and a company, between an organization and between countries. I use this every day in my three and a half years in China. It made me more friends. Well, the thing that made me more friends was singing in Chinese, but then this was the second thing. It's called the FIRO B, F-I-R-O-B. We're not going to have time to go through it, but those of you that are interested, you can stay afterwards, and I'll go over it with you. FIRO B. F-I-R-O-B. It has three things, inclusion, control, and appreciation. You get those down, and you'll be really popular. Keep going. This is a funny one. I had the honor of being the first American to jump with a parachute unit in China. And here I am about to make the jump. And the general 
Chinese general is fixing my parachute for the third time. And I said, I know why you're fixing my parachute and looking at it, because if I get hurt, you'll all be executed. And they're laughing. <laughs> I tried to jump in China for two years, and they wouldn't let me jump. I said, General, you're too old. You don't know our parachutes. You may get hurt. You're the first general we have. We hate to have you die jumping with us. So the Secretary of Defense at that time came to China, and I said, Mr. Secretary, I've been trying to jump with the Chinese, and they won't let me. Would you please talk to the Minister of Defense? Yeah, sure, Byrne. The next day, he opened it up and said, why don't you let my general jump? I said, oh, Mr. Secretary, the general is old. He doesn't know our parachutes. And uh, he doesn't know our techniques. He might get hurt. Secretary of Defense, without blinking an eye, says, well, you don't understand. I have hundreds of generals in the Pentagon. If he dies, I'll send you another one. <laughs> Within a week, I was parachuting with the Chinese <laughs> Army. And they, wherever I went to China, the first thing I showed, oh, sure, Zhongguo San Bing. I am a Chinese paratrooper. That opened more doors than anything else. I got the signal that I only have three minutes. I'll go through this very quickly. These are the first two Chinese cadets from the mainland to ever visit West Point. We have a uh, West Point female cadet teaching them line dancing in front of 2,000 cadets. Next, this is a general that was wounded by U.S. artillery in Korea fighting us. And I shook his hand and said, you and I have something common. I have shrapnel, which is Chinese, and you have shrapnel, which is U.S., in your body. And we are supposed to be here making sure we never exchange ammunition that way. Next. This is what I'm going after. I want to create lieutenants. We begin with cadets. And as they go up, major, lieutenant, colonel, that's 15 years from now, when China is the equal of the United States in military power and something is going wrong, I want that lieutenant colonel who went to China next year as a lieutenant, as a cadet, to be able to pick up the phone and say, things aren't going well. We need to talk. So this is why I'm here today, to do the Friendship Award, to make 100 people to go to China to teach preventive medicine. This is General Powell and I in China. Keep going. Keep going. Go fast if you can. Go fast. I, uh, this is an aircraft carrier opening up. We just came in from Guatemala where we did uh, medical help. Keep going. That is that uh, it's a carrier that's a hospital ship. Keep going. These are the people that we saw. Keep going. And this brings me to the end. I had more, but I want to leave some time for you to answer, ask questions. This is it. You can look at my website, helpingotherstoday.com. The mission is Chinese and Americans walking in the Western Hemisphere, teaching children how to teach others preventive medicine. What are your questions? If you have questions, take out the little piece of paper you got when you walk in the door and write the question on the piece of paper and just pass from the center here. And this young lady in the back is going to collect the questions, and then I'll read them. We, the first question, sir, uh, and we only have about 10 minutes, so we'll get a couple of these here. How do you use psychology in your relationship with the Chinese? Who, who asked that question? Uh, you, why don't you stand up and tell me what you're interested in? Um, I'm actually going to change my major. <laughs> From psychology, and I want to be a religion professor. OK. Well, right, right now I work at the prison. Right now I work at the prison as an internship in the sex offender treatment program. So that interests me a tiny bit. Okay. I use psychology every single day. If you want to take a course, take a psychological course. It'll stand you in good stead. I quickly went through what was the instrument I showed you? What's the name of it? Fyro B. I used it every day. That's a psychological instrument that is given to people that are healthy. If you want to have a better relationship with your girlfriend, take the Fire B. If you want to have even a better relationship with that girlfriend, have her take the Fire B. You will understand each other much better. Okay, next question. 
Sir, the next question. How do you envision a U.S.-China relationship 15 to 20 years in the future? I just came back from China. I spoke at three universities. As a matter of fact, the president of the university in Hangzhou, it's a little bit bigger than you, 42,000 students in-house, in-house, 100,000. But they're in-house, 42,000 students. And they asked me very good questions. And one of the questions was, are you afraid of a strong China? And I said, no, I'm not afraid of a strong China. I am afraid of a strong China that is not friendly to the United States. That's what I'm afraid of. And then I told the students, I was there in the university with a program that is called FACES. I don't know, anybody heard FACES? You might want to volunteer for it. It is 15 students that compete all over the universities in the United States, and they go to Berkeley for 15 days, and they're Chinese that compete all over China, and they choose those, and they go to Berkeley, and they mix together for 15 days, and they have speakers like me come in and talk to them, and then they go to China, the, the Americans, and meet with the Chinese again, but they meet after six months. They, they uh, uh, set goals of what they want to do together to b do better relations. And six months later, they meet in China. And I spent three days with them at this university talking about uh, US-China relations. So what do I see? 15 years from now, friction with China. And we better be prepared with a bunch of officers, uh, civilians that know China well and that have been able to build a friendship. There's a statement that I love. The biggest, most powerful weapon in the arsenal of a nation is a citizen who is trusted by the counterparts of another nation. And that's what I want to build. Citizens of the United States who are trusted by the Chinese to make sure that we talk to them and prevent war. Thank you, sir. Next question, sir. What advice do you have for maintaining fluency in so many languages? learned quite a few languages. How did you learn those languages and how do you maintain your fluency? I wake up at 5.30. I'm on the beach running. I run three miles every day on a beach, barefooted, and then I go swim in the ocean. I run with cards. I run with cards with my Chinese because my Chinese is the most fragile of all the languages. And your ideograms really kind of disappear quickly. And then I do my sit-ups every morning. I do my sit-ups. While I'm doing my sit-ups, I'm singing in Chinese. So I, I put in about 15 minutes every day of practicing Chinese while I'm running, while I'm doing my sit-ups. And then when I'm eating my breakfast, I go to the college where I teach medicine. I have two tape recorders. One, when that one finishes, the other one automatically goes on. And it's just Chinese conversation, so that I keep the fluency. Russian, I've taught Russian. I got it. The only problem now is if I'm speaking Chinese for a long time, it takes me a minute to switch back to Russian. Spanish, it's a simple language, no problem. French, my first native tongue. I just listen to a couple of songs in French, and it comes back. <coughs> keep your fluency by having a shortwave radio and just open it up to the language and hear the news in that language. It's not that difficult, guys. You want to keep fluency? Do your exercises in that language. Then find somebody who speaks it and join the club. I think at RTC, sir, we'll start doing exercises in foreign languages now. So there you go. That's a great one, sir. There you go. Sir, as we're wrapping up, we've got about uh, three, four minutes here. Uh, why do you believe preventive medicine is the key to providing, improving our relationship with China? Well, I already mentioned that. Medicine is neutral. You all raised your hand. Everybody wants to be healthier. So if you have a message of medicine, it's a medicine that you're coming down there of friendship. You're trying to teach people how to be healthier. Okay, where's my instructors? I'm leaving this with my two cadets. Why don't you come on up? I don't feel very well. I don't feel very well. I don't feel very well. No me siento bien. Estoy con un dolor tremendo. Uh, uh, 
，为什么为什么你现在你什么有什么病？不给，他是气哦。我在这里，因为我有痛苦的肚子。啊，你说转一下。他，那他肚子疼。呃，呃，呃，我的我的肚子非常很痛。呃。Por qué tu tu de tu de estómago dolor? Tuza, tuza, ah tuza, ah, pero estómago, estómago. Ah, ¿por qué me dice que tu tuza fue tan tonto? ¿Por qué el estómago le le duele? No sé por qué el estómago me duele. Por eso es que estoy aquí, pero el estómago me duele y me duele aquí. Okay, we're running out of time, but this is what we did. We taught a Chinese doctor to speak in Chinese to a cadet. Who translated his Chinese into Spanish to a Spanish-speaking patient who doesn't speak any English? So this is what we're doing the second week of August in Miami at the university that I teach, Barry University. We're bringing in five West Point cadets who are taking Chinese. We're going to teach them Spanish in five days to be able to do this to interpret for Chinese doctors on a Chinese hospital ship. Give them a hand. That's it. Okay, and those of you who want to ask questions or anything, stay afterwards. And remember, I really would love for you to join our army. And uh, where, are you, where do you have the leaflets, Captain? The leaflets are over here. It'll teach you how to, how to join that army. I'd like for you to join one time with me. Again, just stand up and hold hands one time very quickly. Ten after, and you got to go to school. Ready? Just say, "I'm proud to be an American." I'm proud to be an American. Go beat those exams. Go.